It's really my pleasure to um, have Sanjay Rao here. Sanjay is the uh, director of the movie Gathering, and I'm going to uh, read a beautifully written bio of you, Sanjay, just to start you off embarrassed, um, just uh, because uh, it, the work you've done is marvelous. So Sanjay spent 15 years working on human rights campaigns globally, something I know that resonates with all of us. Um, He's also uh, run initiatives for acclaimed artists and philanthropists. Um, one, of, one of them uh, who uh, encouraged him to start making films, his first documentary, Food Chains, which he made in 2014, was produced by Eva Longaria and Eric Schlosser, narrated by Forrest Whitaker, uh, and Sanjay won numerous awards uh, for that. Uh, it was released in many cities and acquired by Netflix. Uh, Subsequent to that, he's produced uh, or directed two movies, uh, 3100 Run and Become, uh, and most recently Gathered, which we'll be discussing this, e this evening. Sanjay, we're so delighted for you to join us and welcome to the IHAS community. Once you join our community as a guest, you're always a member uh, and always welcome. And we have a wonderful tradition of a Sunday supper where we get together as a community and, and celebrate um, the, our mission and, and our friendships. And so I promise you that the next time that we can have a Sunday supper, uh, we would love to have you join us. Um, you know, as I said, I, I just, uh, when I watched this movie, I, I was really moved. It, it's such a gorgeous movie and it evokes so many feelings in me. Um, and for those of you who may have watched it, you know, it was, hopeful, it made me angry, parts of it made me sad, it was joyous. Um, and the way that Sanjay told the story, you know, through the lens of, of you know, three different people with, uh, on, on a similar mission to, you know, achieve really reclaiming, you know, their culture, their identity, uh, and their agency, I thought was uh, so effective. And so, you know, just to start tonight's discussion, um, Sanjay, I wondered if you could kind of give us a backdrop of the history, you know, and, and you know, kind of what led to the point of what you um, documented in the film, just to get everybody, because we've got a lot of people here from international uh, locations, just to kind of give everybody level set on the history of uh, Native American people in the United States. First of all, I should say, Thank you for doing all of this. I'm really thrilled to be here and, and join everyone tonight. But going back to that, the question, prior to 1860, the majority of the world's economy was agriculture-based. When um, the doctrine of discovery or the kind of Catholic imprimatur was given to various nation states to explore the world for economic gain, the Spaniards were looking for a city of gold. Anglo-European uh, nation states were recognizing that the value of potential colonization was in the topsoil. And again, it's like, you know, these nation states were staking explorers. They were like venture capital funds staking entrepreneurs to get on ships, effectively pirates, to, to go around the world and to begin to stake economic claims. Now, some groups did that with the idea of, of trade in mind and um, reciprocal arrangement but through a whole series of di disconnected events, it became very clear by the mid 1650s that the value of Turtle Island, the, what was going to be the United States lay in its topsoil. And contrary to kind of the modern romantic romanticizing of Native American uh, traditions, the entire Eastern seaboard was not wilderness. It was a series of interlinked ecosystems, farming, grazing, animal, um, uh, you know, animal passageways, um, hunting grounds, fishing grounds, et cetera, that really encompassed a traditional set of ecological knowledge that spanned thousands of years. But those lands, as fertile as they had been kept, were quickly monocropped into corn, um, I, should, I should say into, into cash crops like tobacco, uh, cotton, things that had export value. Native Americans, in a euphemistic sense, were not very good enslaved people because they could easily escape. They knew the land. And so this colonial colonizing economy went to agrarian communities in West Africa, specifically to communities that farmed and enslaved people there 
brought them to Turtle Island to really jumpstart this economy. You know, again, it's like this was the beginning of the economies of scale. You know, if you could take land, there was very little value in, in or very little, you know, like, like um, CapEx, very little investment value. If you could subsidize that through a one-time purchase of enslaved people and then just subsidize their livelihoods for the next hundred years or so, you could then make these economies work for you. And so it's the conundrum of America. It's like the economy was based in the soil. The ideals were based from a deeper part of human consciousness. But the Native American peoples from the beginning of the United States were forcibly removed from urban centers and moved at one point west of the Mississippi uh, to a, an area that was going to remain forever sovereign for Indian people. But um, the push for the American economy required land, settlers, immigrants coming from overseas, if they wanted to lay claim for their families, they needed a space to participate in an agricultural economy, which is why the Midwest eventually became farming land. And that's kind of the story. We, we know from um, you know, Black Lives Matter and a lot of racial justice um, programs that there's an obvious institutional aspect or legacy um, to enslave people, to, to ra the racism that African-American communities face, really around the policing of their bodies. Native American people were part of the obverse, the reverse of that same coin. Their worth was effectively in the absence of their bodies on the land. And so the institutional policies that continue to decimate Indian country are very much rooted in the government's conception of what ownership of land is. And at the end of the day, with the doctrine of discovery, natives don't actually own the land that has been reserved for them. They're, they're given occupancy, but that's the kind of nutshell that forms a basis of our approach to gather. Yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, I, I read um, that this whole expansion, westward expansion, actually, you know, could have been part of the start of the Revolutionary War because, as you said, that land was set aside. Um, but the economic push to move west really overrode that. So that, that's really helpful. Um, and, and so, Sanjay, before we kind of dive into, you know, some of the discussion on the movie, for those who of um, our guests who have not seen the movie yet, would you kind of kind of give like a sketch of it uh, so that they can you know follow along in, in, in the discussion? Sure. The, the movie follows three communities in the lower 48 states. Uh, we follow a young female scientist in South Dakota on the Cheyenne River Lakota, the Cheyenne River Sioux territory, um, a young woman who is exploring the scientific benefits of buffalo meat something that had been integral to her people for thousands of years. Um, the herds were decimated from populations in the millions to populations in just double digits as a tactic to subjugate the very militarily powerful Plains natives. We also follow a couple of characters in the Apache territories in Eastern Arizona, a chef named Nephi Craig, who had a history of fine dining experience, who was, try who was trying to restart um, kind of a, the Apache culinary traditions, starting a cafe uh, with fine dining principles, but with indigenous Apache ingredients. He has a cohort of partners, including um, a forager named Twyla Casador. And the third set of stories is on the mighty Klamath River on the border of California and Oregon, a group of boys who called themselves the Ancestral Guard, who are basically just trying to eke out survival in an area that's effectively a food desert away from traditional supply chains and on a river that's been dammed four times, really decimating the population of salmon that had defined his people's cultural and spiritual practices. That, that's terrific. terrific. Now, I, I must say that I really love um, the young lady uh, scientist, Elsie uh, Dubray, um, because I'm kind of geeky myself, um, but I won't give away her story because it, I think it's really uh, exciting. Um, so, so that, that's really helpful, Sanjay. And so, you know, um, I, I, you know, I found as I was watching this movie, I, I kind of pride myself in studying American history, but there are a lot of um, things that I didn't know that I found really stunning. So for instance, um, 
you know, 30 to 60 million buffalo were slaughtered to decimate the flu food supply uh, for Native Americans. And really that was an attempt to break their culture, you know, or, you know, even um, the young men on the uh, uh, Yukon River were, were talking about, well, one of their elders was talking about in his lifetime, his grandparents were not allowed to live their way of life. They were forcibly uh, forced not to do that. Uh, you know, again, as a way to um, decimate or to, uh, to break the culture. And, and really not too long ago, you know, in the lifetimes of some of us. So, so many of these intentional actions have gotten us where we are today. And, and so can you, can you kind of talk about that, maybe reflect on, you know, some of the, um, you know, uh, insights that came out of the movie? You know, it's, it for Native American people, the food system had always defined their spiritual practices. And, and this, this holds true for pretty much everyone on this call, whether you've been in the US for 100 or 200 or 500 years, our ancestors all came from very specific places uh, with, the, with the exception of, of some populations that underwent kind of constant persecution like populations of Ashkenazi Jews our ancestors were very rooted to very specific places for tens of thousands of years. Now we know that human beings with a jacket or with minimal clothes can survive anywhere that there's clean water and air. It, the, the body is very resilient. But if you're, you were born and had to live in an area, let's say north of the Arctic Circle and couldn't tolerate a high fat diet, you had no mechanism to exchange calories energy with your environment because of that lack of adaptation to the food environment around you, you would die and not pass on your genes. So the corollary is true that our ancestors genetic strength passed down to us was based on very specific adaptations to foods, plant medicines, animal proteins, et cetera, within a very confined biome. In this day and age, you know, most of us are such a melange of different family branches that it's hard to really trace where that genetic strength came from in terms of techniques and products. But for native people, it's twofold. Number one, the majority of native people in, the nor in North America were displaced from traditional land or their traditional lands were, were highly constricted. Um, at the same time, their food systems, like with the example of the buffalo, were destroyed pretty perniciously as a way to subjugate their people under American uh, rule of law. Number two, there was a cultural genocide that happened where until 1977, it was legal to kidnap Native American children and put them into boarding school. And in those boarding schools that tens of thousands of Native kids had to attend, um, speaking their traditional language was forbidden. So across generations, you're getting, and this was, the, this was the, the, the mission, you're getting Americanized, assimilated Native Americans who lose their language. And the language held the names of the specific plants. It held the names of the foods, the dishes, the combinations. And so you lose that language, you lose the connection with your ancestral environment, you lose your sense of identity. So reintroducing those food systems gives people access to language, which gives people access to songs, to prayers, and identity in a system that's trying to make them generic Americans without any roots and denying them access to those roots. So all of us can heal through food systems, but for Native Americans, the healing is deeper than just dietary or genetic. Yeah, so, so Sanjay, you know, one of the things that I, I found really uplifting about the film was that, you know, there are a lot of young people who are engaged in this. And, and listening um, to your remarks, it, I just reflect that a lot of that culture, you know, was lost through, you know, pernicious intentional actions. And so the people who have that memory are probably, you know, more elderly. And so it becomes um, really urgent to make sure that the culture is maintained and so can you talk about kind of that connection of the elders um, to the young people and, and the energy uh, that you feel that you saw in that? Sure, you know, from a, a, a Western standpoint, 
even though this is a little bit of a misnomer, there isn't necessarily an institutional value in the transmission of knowledge between generations. Whereas most of, most of us who grew up with grandparents understood how valuable those interactions were. And if you codified that from like an Eastern standpoint, I'm, I'm originally from India, um, there's actually a practice of, of learning from elders. Of course, that exists within the American university system. You know, thesis professors, once you get to a graduate level, can have a very, very powerful influence. But like you said, when knowledge is so highly specific to an ecosystem, like let's say the boys who live on the Klamath River, you know, the knowledge of the ecosystems of that specific river, the times of year when salmon runs happen, how to really understand the health of populations just by looking at the numbers, the biodiversity and the pollinators, the strength and life of the trees that form the banks of this river, that comes from decades of ecological observation. And so one can jumpstart their own knowledge of their own particular food system through that slow absorption of knowledge. So each of our characters learns and, you know, from elders in their community. And that's, that, that is their traditional um, form of knowledge. You know, I, I, I should just throw out there that, you know, my, my dad came to the U.S. in the 60s to study with a professor named Jack Harlan at Oklahoma State University, um, studied agriculture, and then uh, moved to the to, uh, University of Illinois, um, Champaign-Urbana. And Jack was part of the Green Revolution, but he saw the need for preserving indigenous biodiversity in crops. And so my dad's first job was with the Rockefeller Foundation in Ibada, Nigeria, where I was born. He worked for the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. And um, you know, he actually went through West Africa collecting indigenous seeds, which are now stored in a seed bank in Fort Collins, Colorado. So as much as I tried to push away from my dad's own background of like working with indigenous communities and understanding the genetic strength of their foods and keeping those food systems and those sources of genes away from the, the mass hybridization and the, the mass scale of the modern food system, you know, I, I find myself back in those very same topics. Yeah, I bet that's a real beautiful story. And, and Peter, um, that's a real tribute to, to your family and, and a lot of the good that uh, your family's done. So, um, so uh, as I said, you know, um, I loved all the protagonists, especially uh, Elise. Uh, you know, but one thing that really uh, touched me about the movie is, you know, we've got this historical background, which I think you lay out and interweave um, you know, key points very nicely in the movie. And we actually, through telling the story through actual people, you know, for me, it makes it real, very real uh, to have a sense of what they live through today. Um, a lot of people talked about substance abuse or lack of opportunity or, you know, having to fight the system to preserve their way of life. Um, and I, it was more real than reading a history book, I guess is what I'm trying to say, Sanjay. But, but one thing I really felt, it, why I felt hopeful while, while I was watching the movie is that really it was uh, sharing solutions, right? And so for all the problems, some of them we're aware of, some of them, you know, new to us, you can really, particularly in these times of COVID and 2020, really fall into a funk. Um, but I think that you kind of beautifully laid out for us the idea that there are solutions and people are making progress, you know, through their own engagement and agency. So, so could you maybe um, touch a little bit on that and, and, you know, why you did it that way as well and, and what you hope to achieve? You know, from a, a macro standpoint, since I would imagine that most of us on, on the Zoom are, are not indigenous North Americans, you know, we wonder what's our connection to Indian country? Like, basically, why should we care? You know, most of us know about the Standing Rock uh, protests in North Dakota in 2016, I believe, that the Native people there were protesting a pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline, taking, I believe, 
um, shale um, gas or oil through their reservation. Native Americans principally have been serving as stewards of their land with a multi-generational, um, multi-century outlook for the health of their land. So traditionally they felt required to look at the, the impacts of today through the lens of hundreds of years from now. One of the reasons why the Standing Rock Sioux tribe didn't want that pipeline wasn't just because leaks would destroy their own food system, and there have been subsequent leaks, but that the pipeline was going to cross underneath the Missouri River and would pollute the watershed, you know, stretching a thousand miles south. Um, the Ancestral Guard in the movie are such fierce fighters for the health of the Klamath River system. Um, at the same time, they understand that the four dams in the Klamath have really been diverted for unsustainable agricultural practices in Southern Oregon and giving a free, free unlimited access to water for a lot, of, a lot of commercial conventional farmers in Central California. Now that water, in many, from many standpoints, is literally being wasted. But just 10 days ago, the governor of Oregon, the governor of California, both agreed to terms with the company that owns the four dams, Pacific Energy Corporation, to remove those dams because everybody understands that those dams have a cost, uh, an environmental cost right now. They've got a long-term water usage cost and that long-term solutions need to start happening now. And that's being driven by a small number of native people trying to reclaim the health of their own land. So this concept of native stewardship in rural America particularly in areas where there's a lot of resources passing through, whether it's water or natural gas or oil, has deep, deep ramifications for the rest of us. So when it came to structuring the movie, you know, we wanted to give these native activists a seat at the table. You know, most conversations don't include native activists. Most farm bill discussions don't include native stewards of land, people practicing these traditional ecological forms of knowledge who can tell us exactly how destructive and specifically how destructive the food supply chain is, not just for them, but for Americans across the country. People don't necessarily wanna hear that, but we wanted to give space to these activists to be treated like experts, which is why we don't have talking heads. We don't have outside voices, even native professors or legal scholars we felt that the people who are living in the environment that they're advocating for are the ones who are closer to the truth. And so although our characters seem simple and they might seem um, very, 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 you know, regionally based, they're famous across Indian country. Um, most of the native chefs in the country right now have got, got their start directly through convenings by Nephi Craig, while mm -hmm. or the forager is the, literally the matriarch to a whole movement of native culinary professionals. Sammy and his group are connecting with indigenous youth on rivers all around the world, sharing tactics, learning tactics. I mean, the, the interesting thing too is, I mean, this is, the, this is the, the, the conundrum of the Western system where the Novo Foundation, specifically Peter and Jennifer Buffett provided the majority of funding for um, Gather. And their foundation is primarily based on the largesse of Berkshire Hathaway. Um, Berkshire Hathaway owns Pacific Energy, which owned the four dams on the river. So we have basically gotten money from Berkshire Hathaway to make a movie about kids trying to protest against Berkshire Hathaway holdings. At the end of the day though, and this is the beautiful thing, the ancestral guard feel, and I won't share the details of this, but they feel that the presence or the participation of Peter and Jennifer Buffett in the movie seeped into the consciousness of the Berkshire Hathaway uh, board. And that ultimately provided the emotional impetus to kind of get rid of, get rid of these albatross investments up there. So this is, this is a, a non sequitur. I'm, I'm only sharing this because Sammy himself you know, was the linchpin of this movement fighting one of the largest conglomerates in the US. And it shows that these folks on the ground, they've got a message and that message is resonating. And these kids who are completely economically disadvantaged can create a value proposition 
course, with other tribal members, create a value proposition for some of the largest engines of capitalism to see things from their point of view. Wow, I, I love that. Um, and you know, as, as you were talking, I was reflecting on a lot of the residents uh, of uh, International House, you know, have similar aspirations for their fields and, and their countries um, and the things that they care uh, passionately about. In fact, um, one of our, our residents was one of the um, uh, attorneys who um, argued and won the LGBT rights case uh, in front of the Indian Supreme Court. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot of simpatico uh, with, with our residents and, and with um, the protagonists in, in the movie. Can you talk a little bit more about um, uh, Elsie Dubray and her dad and, and the whole story of, of um, Buffalo and, and what they're trying to achieve there? So going back to the example of genetic specificity, the entire physical culture of Lakota, of Sioux way of life revolved around the bison. And the bison, you know, they ran all the way from Alaska down to Sarasota, Florida. Uh, the Great Plains, the Midwest of the United States was once considered the third largest carbon sink in the world. But because of the push and the pressures of the economic climate of the 1800s. Again, it's all land-based. The only way you can really make money as an immigrant outside of a city is to have land to farm on. Um, there was a, a lot of incentives for decimating the, the rich grasslands of the plains and turning that into monocropped corn, wheat, other products to such a degree that by the 1920s, the health of the topsoil had completely been disappeared and we had a dust bowl in the US which would have been unfathomable a hundred a hundred years ago when every direction you might have looked you would have seen four to six foot tall prairie grasses with the roots that might have extended one two three meters down into the ground so her people we they followed the bison those bison were the apex animals for a lot of the regeneration of the soil the millions that would trample the plains would push seed down, pollinators, birds, other animal life would literally revolve around these massive creatures and the Lakota depended on them. And so their culture arose around the buffalo. Um, coming of age ceremonies involved hunting buffalo, skinning buffalo, both for women and for men. Um, there was a great deal of skill in learning how to use a buffalo to make all of your clothes because of the gratitude that Native Americans felt to the buffalo as creatures given to them by the creator to sustain the life of their people, there were deep embedded spiritual practices. And when the buffalo were killed, not only was the environment destroyed, but Native American way of life for the Lakota people disappeared. And so Fred Dubray in the movie talks about how non-natives could understand the environmental incentive for bringing back these magnificent creatures who've been absent from the biomes there for 150 years, but whose presence created these biomes across hundreds of thousands of years. We understand that, but he said as non-natives, we, we might not understand how bringing back the buffalo rejuvenates language. It rejuvenates the community spirit that's missing from all of our food systems, where people go out to hunt, they go out to harvest, they meet on weekends, they grow, they cook, they dry, they preserve together. And when you've got those bonds of cohesion, you understand the problems in the community, mental health, economic, otherwise. And as a community, you begin to solve those. So culturally, that's important. But spiritually, when the entire US economic system is trying to make you feel worthless for being a Native American, you know, getting that strength back from the presence of the buffalo is, is critically important. So it's a long way of getting to your question. Elsie, is in a system where there is no USDA approval for serving buffalo meat to Native American children. It's considered game, it's not a, a farmed animal. And so the economic and institutional system forbids Native Americans from using buffalo the way they'd like to. Everything's revolving around cattle. And so Elsie is trying to prove effectively to the American food system that bison is a better health alternative to corn raised cattle. And so of course she knows that if she can push that through and make bison 
a healthy standard for Native American kids across their reservation, then the cultural aspect will come back, the spiritual aspect will come back. But she's got to go about it from a capitalistic standpoint. She can't just make the case that we need to have the buffalo back because we deserve it. She has to prove the economic viability from a USDA standpoint to reintroduce buffalo to her people. Yeah, I, I like I said, I, I love her. She, she's really inspirational. I mean, everybody was, but um, some of you, when you see the movie, uh, you'll see her at the science fair and she rocked it there. So um, I'm going to uh, open it for questions um, in a minute and Ciesa will um, uh, conduct the, the Q&A for us, uh, just as a reminder uh, to put your questions in the chat and, and Cieza, while, while you're getting that ready, you know, um, I, I just would like to um, thank you, Sanjay, you know, particularly for the timing of this movie, because I think, you know, to me, 2020 is a year of a lot of reflection because we've all, you know, kind of slowed down. Um, we're in our homes and we've seen a lot of things happen in our country, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, uh, and, and now this piece of history and uh, you know, other things going around in different parts of the country. And I, I think it helps us start to stitch together. What is it? What is the United States and what is it um, to be American? And, and you know, kind of in my mind, you give us a platform to understand from even another uh, lens that's not as familiar uh, to us, what, what people really aspire for. Uh, in their lives. Uh, and so I really want to thank you for that. So Cieza, I will um, turn it to you to start our Q&A. We've got about uh, 20 minutes. Uh, that was uh, uh, really interesting. I know uh, uh, the Rockville, our family does with uh, Peter, Peter and Jennifer Buffett. Uh, you're seeing a movement of uh, replanting uh, perennial uh, plants you know, for better uh, fiber and dealing with uh, uh, climate change. Did you run across much of that in the uh, film? We, we, we did, Peter. There's, 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 you know, there's been a lot of legal impediments to growing native crops like hemp, for example. I think there was even a Supreme Court case um, that a tribe lost I believe about 15 years ago um, and trying to reintroduce those traditional fibers. But, you know, there's a, a foundation called the Regenerative Agriculture Foundation in California um, that I think is run through the Schmidt Family Foundation. And they've been funding a few Native American tribes in the Midwest, the Ho-Chunk tribe, um, tribes in Minnesota in developing that hemp economy again at the same time, I, I know there's a program on Elsie's reservation where I believe it's, um, I forget which foundation, one of the, the conservation foundations has actually helped to mitigate some of the, the ill effects of using prairie land for cattle grazing um, and has subsidized the, the conservation of that land and is actually subsidizing now the conversion of some of the cornfields to industrial hemp for uh, usage of, for fiber usage. Can I ask one more question before I, uh, uh, so we seem to be in a, uh, hopefully a new sort of civil rights movement that, you know, is opening up uh, people's eyes that, you know, a lot of things that, uh, uh, a lot more things have to do change. And I'm hearing even more uh, acknowledgement about Native Americans and been a lot about uh, African Americans. And are you, do you think there'll be a civil rights movement that will uh, honor and make some uh, changes for uh, Native American peoples? That's a great question. And, you know, I, I, I know that there have been a lot of deep seated differences between tribes. Um, these are like 574 neighbors of one another that have very kind of varied histories with one another. 
But in the last few years, there's been a movement on the tribal level to begin advocating cohesively with oneness for the farm bill and other things like that. Native American youth are really connected to Black Lives Matter protesters and to civil justice protesters. People are beginning to understand that again, it's like the African American story is literally the obverse and the reverse of the Native American story. The timelines sync up, the institutional legacies of the early economic system are as insidious for African Americans as they are for Native Americans. An example is like, you know, there's there's obviously a lot of research around the school to prison pipeline that affects African American youth in urban centers. That's obviously the policing of the black body. There is a foraging for a food to prison pipeline for Native American youth, which continues to pull them away from their land. Here's, here are two examples. Twyla in the movie um, is on a reservation that was completely locked down for COVID. And at the same time, they weren't getting food deliveries. And so elders left the reservation completely isolated to go to traditional acorn harvesting grounds uh, that were just a few miles off the reservation, away from settlements, away from other cities. They were stopped by fish and wildlife officials and given $1,000 fines um, for collecting food on their ancestral lands, not effectively reservation, but public lands, which are now considered not native lands, even though they've always been native lands. The ancestral guard are facing the loss of their hunting privileges because again, same situation, no food being delivered to this middle of nowhere set of cities in California. A lot of starvation happening amongst elders. And so these boys who have permits to get a certain number of fish per person, a certain number of elk per person had to bag more deer bag more elk so that they could actually feed their community. They got an arraignment from Fish and Wildlife, which in many states doesn't need a warrant, unlike local police. And these young kids are facing um, misdemeanor violations, which will result in the loss of their gun privileges, which means that they won't be able to own rifles for the rest of their life, which means they won't be able to hunt. And these seem like one-off, perhaps conspiratorial elements but it's part of a system which, you know, in, for African-American communities, it's the presence of police officers in schools. For Native American communities, it's the, the over-presence of fish and wildlife officials penalizing them at a higher rate than, non, than non-natives. And that has a, a severe and lasting effect. So everything's coalescing now because they see that they've got the same issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, look, I haven't seen, I'm going to watch the, Katie and I will watch this. Awesome. Can I ask a question? Um, yes. I, because I asked it in the, first of all, I thought it was, this movie was incredible. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I, I, I was like Lauren, I learned so much, like the 60 million buffalo, I couldn't believe that. It was very touching. But so my question, and it was a question of Frank also, how did you select those three uh, area? Why, why did that, I mean, they were fascinating, but how did you select them? That's a great question. Based on, on two criteria. The first was, you know, we, we really wanted to document the aftermath of the American military occupation for Native American tribes, which happened everywhere. But prior to 1860, 1870, there was no footage, there was no photographs. So we really couldn't focus on tribes on the Eastern section of the United States. We really had to look at tribes west of the Mississippi. And the Lakota faced the brunt of the American military, particularly after the Civil War. That's where the famous General Custer had his last stand. Um, the Apache in Arizona, were again formidable foes to the US military in the 1860s. And then in California, as you saw from the film, the genocide there is completely unknown. I mean, I grew up in, in, in Oakland and Berkeley, California, never learned about this stuff. And in America, you know, there's the 13th Amendment, right? Which abolished slavery after the Civil War. But in California, it didn't abolish the enslavement of Native American people, which was still lawful until 1920. So 
that was the academic criteria. But again, it's like the topic is so vast that there was no way we could make a comprehensive film about every native tribe. And I wanted to pick characters who were so engrossing to me. I mean, just like, you know, the fashion industry, right? It's like the person that you see on the street who takes the most beautiful photographs might not be the most classically beautiful person you see on the street, but they have a way to communicate through the lens to the person watching. And so the characters that I wanted to pick needed to have that kind of charisma uh, to be able to kind of convey their consciousness to a viewer just by being silent. As soon as we met the Yurok kids, we knew that we had to find a way to put them in the movie. As soon as we met Twyla Casador, the, the forager, she, we, I said I could follow her for days. It doesn't matter what she does. And then Elsie had so much life and she was so natural around the camera. You know, we didn't spend more than a week or two with each of these characters, uh, maybe three or four weeks total with them spread out over a couple of years, but never once did they ever react to the camera. It's like they knew the camera was there, but they knew how to act or behave in such a way that we could really capture what they were feeling. That, that was the main criteria. Hi Sanjay, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, the film is great and um, your, the insight that you're providing now is also sincerely appreciated. Um, my name is Courtney Street and my father is Native American. He's a member of the, Nan well, we are members of the Nanakoke Indian Association in Delaware. And I've also co-founded an organization focusing on maintaining indigenous farms to carry on the cultural and agricultural traditions that have happened um, in Delaware for centuries. Uh, but from my nine to five, I'm a journalist. Um, and uh, uh, I also had a question about uh, characters and the stories. And in the editing process, we leave a lot on the edit room floor. And there are lots of great things that can't be included. Um, and so I am curious, uh, what stories were you not able to tell or unable to share that um, Worn in the film, but you might be able to share with us tonight. Yeah, you know, um, it's a totally different movie, so I, I won't I won't spend much time on it. But I met this Native American woman named Patty Dillon, um, who was from the Mi'kmaq tribe in Nova Scotia. Grew up in Boston. She was actually Nike's first female sponsored runner. Indigenous. She was second place in Boston three years in a row and faced an incredible amount of pressure from the, the sporting industry for number one, being a woman, number two, being a Native American, um, and number three, kind of being the first commercially sponsored female runner in the United States. And we're turning that into its own standalone movie. And we, we met a number of people like that, that I wish, you know, we... That, that, that literally deserve entire movies of their own. So when it comes to what was left on the cutting room floor, since many of these locations were so hard to get to, we chose them very, very wisely and did a lot of development trips and didn't really focus on any other stories except those. But we did come across some stories that are so unbelievable that we're trying to find ways to turn them into wholly you know, standalone films. But thank you for that and thanks for the work that you do. I should say that, you know, we, in the, the process, obviously, of making a film is completely exploitative. Like, you're meeting a lot of people, and everybody's got the expectation that they're going to be, like, in the movie with you, um, even when you're coming without cameras. And so we actually got a grant to hire a number of Native American journalists across two years, um, who we sent back to uh, reservations that we'd done development trips on to to meet and talk to local farmers that we just met and just gabbed with to turn their stories into print pieces. So um, things even made the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle, um, bunch of stuff in the, in the, the kind of uh, online blog, Civil Eats. And Civil Eats actually started a whole indigenous beat um, and it started covering, as you know, these topics pretty extensively. We had some stories in Topic Magazine, High Country News, kind of usual players. Uh, I, I can send you those. Actually, those links are all on our website, gather.film. Hi, um, you, it's hi, Karen Sutton. 
you've answered one of my questions. I have a very dear friend that's a Native American. And so I've been pretty involved in helping her, you know, support financially all the voting issues that came up during this 2020 election that were horrific. I mean, if you just listened to half of them, you couldn't believe that we were living in a civilized uh, society. Uh, there's also a systemic issue within the educational system in America, because you go from the Pilgrim's Table <laughs> on Plymouth, and then it's like the Indians disappeared until they ended up on a reservation. And there was, as you pointed out, a very thriving community of Native Americans who were trading and growing and the agrarian culture was there. But is there anything you've come across in your research that speaks to some kind of heightened, um, uh, a, a heightened uh, acceptance or not acceptance, but a heightened um, a, um, push to actually change the educational system. Our, edu our history books are a story. It's, it's like the Bible. <laughs> I can't even believe it, that we are a country that's only 200 and something years old, and we have fiction in our history books about our, about our indigenous population. That's my question. That's a great question. Um, and there's probably people on the call that, like Courtney, that will know a lot more about it than me, but the, like the state of South Dakota, for example, that was South Dakota, I think has two or three million acres um, of its state land as, as tribal reservations, they actually eliminated a curriculum requirement to study the Lakota people from their K through 12 lesson plans and state requirements. There, there's a foundation in New Mexico, there's a foundation in California and one in Arizona that have been set up by native tribes to effectively reintroduce uh, the histories of local natives into state curricula but apart from that, there's, there's basically nothing. And, and you, know, you mentioned Plymouth. It's, obviously, it's 400 years almost to, to the, the season that the mm -hmm. Ashby first extended a hand to the, the, the folks on the Mayflower. And they have been under threat of losing their tribal sovereignty under the Trump government. Um, and they're continuing to fight a battle in court. So. It's been 400 years and they're still fighting for their land. You know, I'm not saying that there's anything insidious to it, but it's like, again, it's like the structures around the US are still perpetuating this a philosophy of land access and continued ability to exploit all lands for economic resource extraction or living space. And so it's not necessarily in the interest of these institutions to promote an exhaustive history of Native Americans. That said, you know, I know that there are a lot of smaller movements, particularly in private schools that are, are beginning to reach out to local tribes. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a number of private schools um, that are really focused on you know, ethnic studies and are bringing in these topics, mainly by trying to bring in films like Gather, speakers from local native communities, and really promoting the, the, the reality that natives still exist. Right. Right? Like, as you know from voting, it's like they provided sizable, you know, mar sizable parts of the margin in Arizona, in Minnesota, right. in Wisconsin for President Biden. And there's a big push to register Native Americans in Georgia, even though those tribes in Georgia aren't federally recognized, they are state recognized. There's 150,000 natives in Georgia. Um, and so I, I think that people realize that they're contributing to progressive society and the progressive movements are beginning to understand their worth in our political system. Um, and that's a good step, but again, you know, they're, they've been pushed as far away from the hubs and the spokes of the supply chain. They're, they were pushed away from railroads, which now form the backbone for the highway system. They were pushed away from urban centers. So they're living in areas that are not just economically disadvantaged, but are literally the, at the terminus or past the terminus of food delivery systems. And, you know, I, 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 I wish there was an easy solution. I, that's why we may gather. It's like we're trying to focus 
on a on a set of points that all of us can really enjoy. I mean, we all watch so much food television where people cook stuff, but we can't eat it. There's just something weird in our brains where we like watch other people cook and eat. And so that was the idea of bringing in Nephi to try to bring in some of these themes and really making the connections between native history and the modern food system and how we eat all of these products. But lastly, I should say that we've probably in two months screened at think we screened this film for 600 um, high schools across the US. So we know that there's interest and we're hoping that the structure will, will follow this sort of interest. That's really wonderful. So Cieza, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yes, we have Sierra here with her hand raised. So Sierra, you can unmute yourself. Thanks. Um, I'm one of the few that still haven't watched the film. It was on my calendar, but somehow didn't get to it. But now I have to after this discussion. So my question to you um, would be if you had the audience of the new administration policy team, what would be the top two policy recommendations or policy areas that we should be focusing on? That, that's a great question. There's really one right now that Indian country is focusing on, and that's the position of the Secretary of the Interior, who holds a lot of the keys to public land. Um, that public land has always been native land. Um, that public land has been stewarded by native communities. And, you know, everyone is pushing for, at least the, the progressive native communities pushing for uh, the Congresswoman from New Mexico, Deb Holland, to be the next Secretary of the Interior. I mean, there, there was a, a Deputy Secretary of the Interior who was from Taos Pueblo. I think his name was Mike Connor, who served under President Obama, at least in the second term. Um, he's also up for consideration, but because oil and extractive industries are such a just, a just a devastating presence in tribal communities, and because, you know, in the last few years, um, Mr. O'Connor worked for law firms that represented oil and gas interests, the kind of native progressive flank is really pushing for, for Deb Holland. So that, that's the one thing that people are focusing on right now. Um, because her presence will create an understanding within an administration, within a department that has such a direct impact on day-to-day -day life in Indian country. Yeah, I had seen that um, as well, Sanjay, and, and I'm hopeful. I mean, I think there have been a lot of good picks, uh, you know, in the upcoming administration, for the upcoming administration. Um, listen, uh, this has been a, a really wonderful discussion and I wanna thank you for your um, time um, but especially I want to thank you for your fight for human rights. I know that that is a theme through all your work uh, and you know it's um, very meaningful, I know to me and to uh, the rest of us here. And finally, I would like to uh, welcome you as an honorary member to the uh, International House community and uh, hope we see you soon. We're not too far from where you live and uh, any way that we can help you or continue to engage, it would really be our pleasure. Um, so why don't we all, you guys come back on camera and let's give a round of applause to uh, Sanjay. Thank you guys thank very much. Thank, thank you Sanjay. Thank you Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you guys all um, for- <laughs> Thank you Lauren. Thank you. Thank you Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, well thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, good night, everybody. Hi, hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.